Hi, this is Dr. Christopher Perrin with another episode of The Christopher Perrin Show. This is a podcast that's a part of the TrueNorth.fm podcast network. Thanks for viewing or listening. Today, I want to talk about classical education and Christian nationalism. Uh, Recently, folks have been talking about Christian nationalism. I'm a Christian, and I love my nation. So why wouldn't I be someone who's an advocate of Christian nationalism? Well, there are words, and there are the meaning of words. And this phrase is, of course, a confusing one right now. It was used most most recently as a, as a kind of derisive or derogatory term, criticizing anyone who would advocate Christian nationalism. But it's not always clear what words are referring to. And these are confusing times, and words are being used in some confusing ways. So we do need clarity. And in fact, it's this need for clarity in the midst of ongoing confusion that can also lead to some other problems, other consequences that might even be unintended by those who are trying to speak into them, including myself. So let me offer you a few thoughts in light of recent events and try to contextualize them in light of the renewal of classical education. If we're at a pivotal time right now, and I think we probably are, it's natural that there are varying views, varying views when it comes to the question of how Christians should behave in the polis and what theory or theology of the polis should guide us. What kind of politics should guide us right now. Some are arguing for a form of Christian nationalism, a term that was recently used derisively by the left, but which is now being adopted and used by some Christians like Stephen Wolf in his recent book published by Canon Press, The Case for Christian Nationalism. Now, some in the classical renewal, no doubt, are in some sympathy with Wolf, and some are not, like me. And yes, I've read the book. The sad case of Thomas Accord, who recently was forced to resign from his role as a classical school headmaster, is representative of the variety of political views that characterize those those of us who are in the classical education renewal. There's a variety of views, as you would expect, just everywhere right now. Accord is guilty of posting anti-Semitic and racist comments under an anonymous Twitter account while serving as a headmaster. He first denied the post. He denied that they were his, but then in the face of convincing evidence that it was indeed him, he confessed to this. Furthermore, he's a friend of Stephen Wolf, the author of The Case for Christian Nationalism, and he has co-hosted a podcast with Wolf. Well, look, I don't wish to discredit Wolf's book or the ideas it contains simply because it turns out that his friend and podcast associate had descended into a dark place where he secretly posted many reprehensible views of race, gender, and ethnicity. Wolf's book can stand on its own claims and ideas, many of which I do find problematic, but not all of them. My own views of the book are nearly identical, by the way, to those uh, that have already been posted by Kevin DeYoung in an article on the Gospel Coalition website. So if you, I'm not gonna go into uh, Wolf's book, but if you want to know, uh, if you're curious about what I think about about the book, you can read Kevin's Kevin's uh, very fine review. The point I wish to make here is this. There are some headmasters, some, and leaders in the renewal of classical education with a general sympathy for Christian nationalism. But we're not even sure what we mean when we say Christian nationalism. It's a phrase that suffers from great ambiguity, and so Wolf tries to define it in particular ways in his book. But I just want to point out that the phrase is not at all clear. And so it's very dangerous to say you're for something that no one really can clearly define. We ought not to let the failings of accord discredit those who may be in sympathy with some form of what we might call Christian nationalism. We might we shouldn't think that you must be racist uh, just because you advocate for some form of Christian nationalism. That would be illogical, unjust even though the case of Accord does raise some other concerns. What are those concerns? Well, they're the same concerns that afflict all Christians seeking to chart a political path forward during these tumultuous times. 
History teaches us that when a society begins to fray and fragment, many confused citizens in the muddled middle will gravitate to the poles where strong clarion voices call out. Confusion seeks clarity, and this is a good thing, but it can lead to some problems. Confusion seeks clarity, and clarity often seeks simplicity, and simplicity often leads to folly. Not necessarily, but often. I think the clarion call by some to some form of Christian nationalism is natural and even attractive right now. I also think that it's reductionistic, oversimplified, and therefore fraught with the potential for folly. It's attractive because these are confusing, shifting, troubled times, and because Christians and other traditional moralists feel betrayed. We want the older American culture with a general consensus of traditional morality, traditional Christian morality and ethics back. The epilogue in Wolf's book is an example of this. He's clearly angry, and he's ready to do something about it. While I can't endorse many of his calls to actions in this long epilogue, log, uh, I can still understand the feelings of betrayal. I can understand why many people feel betrayed, frustrated, and angry. Wolf wants concrete, pointed action that will reclaim what was taken. As Kevin DeYoung says in his review of the book, Quote, the appeal to something like Christian nationalism is that it provides a muscular alternative to surrender and defeat. Don't we all want a muscular alternative to surrender and defeat? What classical education leader after such, an great, such a great investment of time, resources, and passion wants to surrender? But here is a chief problem with the call to Christian nationalism, I think, however we might define Christian nationalism. There aren't enough Christians in the United States. Some I know will dispute this, but I don't think there are enough Christians in the United States to make the call for some kind of Christian nationalism meaningful. This makes the call and the Wolf's case simplistic. If the country consisted of 250 million Christians who worshiped in church every Sunday, read scripture, loved their neighbor, and cared for the poor in their communities, well, we would already be a Christian nation by some clear measurements. Wolf's version of Christian nationalism requires a Christian consensus that we're not close to achieving. Even if 64% of Americans identify as Christians, as they apparently do by some statistics, only 47% are members of a church, and much less than that are worshiping weekly. What is a Christian, we need to ask? Short of a third great awakening, I don't believe there's a hope for a Christian consensus that's needed for anything like Christian nationalism, however we would define it. Wolf acknowledges this, but in my opinion, he confuses the ends with the means. He calls for a great renewal, but calling for Christian nationalism will not bring about a great revival. From time to time, we Christians think we are seeing the signs of revival in our midst, and we certainly should be praying for such a thing, for many to come to Christ and to his church. Wolf wants this, though he doesn't call us to pray in the book except to call for a new Christian prince to arise and to pray for that. One of the things I love about the Orthodox Church is that every, every liturgy, every service is full of prayer for peace and awakening as well as a good defense before the dread judgment seat of Christ. All of us should be, be, should be praying daily for the blessing of God to come upon us, our families, our churches, our nation, our legislatures, our Supreme Court, our cities, our mayor, etc., as we in the Orthodox Church do every Sunday. But we should be careful about proclaiming this or that sign of coming revival, in my opinion. The Spirit comes and goes where He wills like the wind, and we have been given no manual for how He moves. We're simply to be faithful in love, 
worship, service, giving, work, and prayer. I remember Robert Schuller some years ago proclaimed that self-esteem was the new reformation. He wrote a book called Self-Esteem, the New Reformation. Let all your scars become stars. Some today are ready to proclaim that classical Christian education is the new reformation. Well, I'm in sympathy with classical Christian education, and I certainly want a, a great renewal. So it's hard for me to resist this desire and even proclamation. I've given my life to the work of the renewal of classical Christian education. I believe in it passionately. I bleed it. But the renewal of classical education, I do not believe, is the new reformation. We should be very careful about proclaiming what this or that may be as the new reformation. It's a renewal, however, of something that rightfully belongs to Christians. It's a deep blessing to most who receive such an education. And in my view, it's prudent and wise to give it as to as many as who will receive it. But it's not the cure. It's not. It's terribly important, but it can't be the panacea. We know this by a few compelling counterexamples. Of the original 12 disciples, none was classically educated, and most were blue-collared fishermen. Jesus was not classically educated, but then again, nor did he need to be. Only Paul was classically educated, and then he counted all his degrees and training as rubbish compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing and following Christ. Is there anything that should qualify for a new Reformation? If there is, it would be not ubiquitous classical education per se, but ubiquitous faith hope, and love. Doesn't Dr. Paul make this clear in 1 Corinthians 13? Even if I speak with the tongues of Latin and Greek and can fathom all mysteries but have not love, I am nothing. When Jesus returns, will he be looking for those of us who have received a classical education or will he be looking for those who have faith, for those who cry out to God day and night as seen in the parable of the persistent widow? We know that we should restore classical Christian education to the church because this is the education cultivated and developed and handed down to us by the church. It's just that. I think that's one way to see it, or maybe the primary way to see it. It's a passed down gift. It was created at great cost and is of enormous value, but it cannot substitute for faith, hope, and and love. If it is to be something, that is what Jesus is looking for when he returns. It must be infused with faith, hope, and love. It must be the vehicle, the carrier, the embodiment of faith, hope, and love. If that's what you mean by classical Christian education, well then perhaps it is the cure. What is more, this is what the tradition of classical education tells us. It tells us that it is faith, hope, and love. That is what we need. It says, if you take me, that is, if a classical education can be an embodied figure, if you take me, take what makes me what I am, Christ and his love. It's like the icon of Mary at the entrance of an Orthodox church. And if you've never seen an icon of Mary at the beginning front of a church, it's, it's, it's often large and looming. And I remember before I was Orthodox, uh, seeing one of these icons and being a bit put off by, well, an encounter with Mary when I came to church, encountering Mary first, because I want to worship Jesus. <laughs> I was about Jesus, and here I am encountering Mary. Until someone pointed out to me that in the icon of Mary, she has her arms extended like this. And of course, in her womb is Christ. And this person said, D -d -d do you know what she's saying? I said, well, no, I don't. And he said something like this. She's saying, say yes to Christ, receive him, even as I said yes to Christ and received him. Oh, that changed things for me. Mary is gesturing to Christ. When you see 
uh, an icon of Mary holding Christ. Well, she's not just holding Christ. She's gesturing to Christ. This is what she is saying. See my son. He is the son. Receive him. If that's what classical Christian education is, okay, then I think maybe it is the cure. This is why classical education, as we have received it, is Christian education. Christ is the teacher in our midst, and all that we really learn, if it's true, good, and beautiful, is Christ, who is the source of all that is true, good, and beautiful. Well, those are some reflections. There's more to say, and of course, I will be saying more in the future. But before I go, uh, let me tell you that my next podcast, I'll be talking about metaphors that we use to describe classical education. What are helpful metaphors? What are the metaphors that have been used, like garden, table, museum, etc.? And which ones should we use and why? And I also want to remind you that you can you can follow me on my Substack newsletter at ChristopherPerrin.substack. And you can also see some of my other teaching videos on classicalu.com. So if you're interested, please visit those websites. And thank you for watching or listening. This is Christopher Perrin with The Christopher Perrin Show on the True North.fm network.